All right, I think I'll go ahead and get things started. I'm sure we'll have more people join us as uh, time progresses, but I wanna make sure that we have the full time for um, the talk today. So welcome everybody to today's um, Contagion Cultures webinar. Uh, my name is Brandon Price. I'm a third year PhD candidate in the Department of Global Studies here at Queen's University. Um, and given that Queen's is hosting this um, and that I am actually on campus, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Queen's is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee um, and that this territory is, is unceded. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody, depending on where you are, to conduct a similar reflection um, based on the original First Peoples of wherever it is you're currently residing. Uh, the Contagion Culture Series is a Faculty of Arts and Science collaboration between the School of Policy Studies and Languages, Literatures, and Cultures within Queen's University Library providing a substantial support. These talks are live streamed at Tuesdays at 4 p.m. The series will continue until the end of the winter term, 2020-21. Queen's Contagion and Cultures lectures help make sense of this pandemic through the expertise and insights of the arts and science faculty members. This public facing series leverages the powerful tools of humanistic analyses to grapple with our turbulent times. To ask questions, and please do, um, submit them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen in the middle. Um, but it is my pleasure to introduce Kasim Tir Tirmaizi. Their um, talk today is titled Anti-Colonial Readings of Pandemics in Punjab. So in it, we were gonna be taken back to British India in 1918 the site of an influence outbreak, outbreak that would devastate the region while having comparatively mild effects elsewhere in the world. A timely and important conversation during this global pandemic. Without further ado, Mark Kazam. Okay, thank you, Brandon, for that introduction. I'm also gonna start sharing my screen as I have a presentation. Okay, so I've, uh, I mean, for this talk, I mean, something that uh, generally some of my research looks at uh, anti-colonialism in British India, uh, especially among uh, peasants in Punjab. And, you know, when this uh, pandemic started, I started thinking about pandemics in different historical periods in, you know, regions where I do research. And so I came up for this, uh, for this talk, I, I've written a presentation, which uh, I'll read, which I think is I mean, reading is never always the best, but I think it, it'll be helpful for uh, integrating this uh, rich historical narrative. Uh, so I'll begin. So on December 5th, 1920, the Friends of Freedom for India met for their national convention at Hotel McAlpin in New York City. I mean, here's a, a photograph from a, a, not that meeting, but a meeting that took place by the Friends for Freedom of India and in New York, uh, in uh, later that year. So the seventh of their 12 resolutions on that meeting were, we charge that under British rule, deeds of violence, deaths from plague, venereal disease, sickness and misery have increased. The meeting was two years after the city had witnessed 30,000 deaths due to the influenza flu pandemic that similarly affected British India with at least 12 million deaths. The Friends of Freedom for India was an organization with anti-colonial internationalist politics that campaigned via the United States for the independence of India. Delegates and speakers at the December event included those in the United States mobilizing for Indian independence like the Gadar Party co-founder Dharaknath Das, uh, Friends of Freedom for India President Robert Morris Lovett, who is also a professor at University of Chicago, and those working for the national liberation of Ireland and Egypt, and you know, labor and socialist organizations in the city, and even Pan-Africanist W.B. Du Bois. The concrete connections between the United States and India were unpacked in that meeting, for example, in how the U.S. was an active agent of the British Empire through the deportation of anti-colonial militants from India. The denouncement linking pandemics with colonialism on that day was not a new one, but such links were made in the writings of Dadabai Nauroji from at least 1897 and in publications of the Gadar Party in the 1910s. Indeed, the connections made between pandemics and colonialism in their texts, you know, they're not very uh, theorized. They don't really elaborate on that, those connections, but as I argue in this presentation, their fleeting statements provide guidelines for developing an anti-colonial reading of the pandemics they experienced. Namely, they suggest that pandemics were not merely biological events 
but we're entangled with social, political, biophysical, and global relations. For instance, the imperialist organization of food production and consumption were tightly woven with how colonized bodies interacted with the transmission of the plague from rats to humans. In reality, these were moments that unveiled how colonialism and imperialism were incapable to sustain life. So such articulations are similarly found you know, as graffiti in public spaces today, uh, as we live through the pandemic, Corona is the virus, capitalism is the pandemic. But in thinking about the present, the critiques made by Naroji and the Gadda party provide anti-colonial reflections for framing how people live through the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus uh, pandemic. But first, uh, let me go back to Punjab in 1918. So, you know, October to December of 1918 was a terribly deadly period in Punjab with about 1 million people dead. That represented 5% of the population. One of the few testimonies that we have that describe those events is by W.H.C. Forster, who was a medical officer, a British medical officer working in the colonial administration in India. He was the sanitary commissioner of Punjab who oversaw the protection of public health in the province. So Forster described those days in apolytic terms. The hospitals were choked, so that it was impossible to remove the dead quickly enough to make room for the dying. The streets and lanes of the cities were littered with dead and dying people. The postal and telegraph services were completely disorganized. The train service continued, but at all the principal stations, dead and dying people were being removed from the trains. The burning ghats and burial grounds were literally swamped with corpses." End quote. So the immediate causes of the massive amounts of deaths and the chaos that came with it was an influenza virus. This was a novel strain of an influenza A virus of the subtype H1N1 that had in a matter of months killed at least about 40 million people across the globe, including Kentucky, Montreal, Auckland, Accra, Durban, Quito, Lahore. Global deaths you know, can be I mean, some say 40 million and some estimates go up to 100 million. You know, uh, the estimates in the United States are uh, 680 million, uh, 600, sorry, 680,000 in the US, 2.3 million in Europe, 26 to 36 million in Asia, and between 12 to 18 million in India. Indeed, there is something quite disproportionate about these numbers. While we can discuss the pandemic as a global phenomenon, it, has, it was always experienced locally. The site of the origin of the 1918 influenza flu pandemic is still being debated, but our army base in Kansas is considered uh, as a site of possible origins. In the winter and spring of 1918, there were high counts of influenza flu among troops in uh, fighting in Europe and the Middle East. And the first wave of infections in India are reported in June uh, at the ports of Bombay and Karachi after British India Army crew returned from fighting during World War I. Infected Indian soldiers deployed to Basra, Iraq, arrived in Punjab via the ports of Karachi and Bombay. Soldiers in the battlefields of Europe and the Middle East were key sites of the transmission of influenza flu virus in general. Once the virus was in the port cities of Karachi and Bombay, postal office employees were important transmitters when they transported mail across the country via the rail network. In Punjab, the first wave of infections were in July of that year with limited cases, but at this point, the flu strain didn't result in a high mortality rate. The second wave in August, uh, I think here we are, so the second wave in August and September was similar in character and being mild and having a low mortality rate. There was a mild epidemic across the province with cases identified in major cities of Punjab like Lahore and Amritsar. And by September, the zone of infection stretched across all corners of the province. The third wave was a different monster altogether. So as an influenza virus moves from one human host to another, there's also the small probability of slight mutations of the virus's genetic makeup. As a virus gets transmitted more often, there's a greater likelihood that it'll mutate to be more or less lethal. Uh, 
the virus in the third wave from October to December was highly contagious as its incubation period was short and it was highly mortal. Its effects were seen you know, from Multan to Mari, from Kampapur to Gurgaon, you know, all the corners of the province. The Sanitary Commission stated in those three months, there was 962,000 deaths. When the virus was in Punjab, general travel, trains, large gatherings, you know, some, like at cinema halls, theaters were important sites for the propagation of the virus. So granted, you know, epidemics were not new in the region. Just the year before, uh, the Punjab saw a surge of deaths due to the plague, and India had in the past decades faced bouts of cholera, smallpox, malaria, and tuberculosis. I mean, these pathogens had a comparable scale of influence as the influenza flu. I mean, for example, the bubonic plague killed 12.5 million people in India from 1896 to the late 1930s. But the difference with the 1918 flu, influenza flu pandemic is its intensity, it killed an equivalent amount of people in just a few months. So now, you know, if we think, uh, I guess we're at 103 years after the peak of the influenza flu pandemic, we're living today in a similar moment of a, another pandemic of COVID-19. In these times, I often hear phrases commenting how the coronavirus affects everyone. Like the coronavirus is the great equalizer, or we're all in the same boat. I mean, the sanitary commissioner of Punjab, WHC Forster, had similar words to say about the influenza flu. Nearly every household was lamenting a death and everywhere terror and confusion reigned. I mean, these statements are definitely true. The influenza flu affected young and old, women and men, those in city and country, rich and poor. And so far in this narrative, that is the story that I've been telling. That story is describing the impacts of the influenza flu as a universal experience. But important questions to ask are, which groups of people were most affected by the influenza flu and why? I mean, Forrester had one answer to those questions. Uh, he estimated 50% of poorer classes who con contracted the disease died, whereas the mortality rates for British in the area was less than 5% and upper-class Indians with access to mes medical facilities at 6%. Rural areas were also more affected than urban areas. So Forrester explained these stark differences on differential access to quality medical attention and unhygienic conditions, especially in the countryside. I mean, his analysis makes it appear that the dramatic mortality rates in Punjab resulted simply from a confluence of contingencies. First, the lower level of rainfall expected from the monsoon, the summer monsoon reduced agriculture output and contributed to higher food prices. The ongoing world war was also said to have increased food prices. So with food becoming more costly, the working class and poor peasants had more difficulty, you know, accessing, you know, taking care of their health, thus making their, them weaker in the face of an influenza flu. So natural and historical events which could not have been controlled were to blame for high mortality rates. Forster was also effectively blaming the poor for their poverty and for living in unhygienic conditions. You know, in a, a more recent study, uh, the historian Ian D. Mills argued that the pandemic of 1918 combined with a famine in India produced mutually exasperating catastrophes, which is something, I guess, in some ways, a similar argument being made by the sanitary commissioner in Punjab at this, in 1918. So during the summer of 1918, an unusual reduction in monsoon rainfall caused similar significant crop failures. It affected broad swaths of India, including uh, Punjab, Gujarat, Bombay, Deccan, Bihar, Rajputana, uh, the southern part of the central provinces and United Provinces. And this corresponds with zones that were the most affected by the influenza flu. Crop failures led to widespread food insecurity, which caused malnutrition and a weakened immune system that was increasingly vulnerable to infection. In Bombay, the influenza pathogen was transmitted across the general population from the British to, the, to Indians, upper to lower castes, Hindus. However, death was starkly differentiated. The mortality rate 
the mortality rate, uh, the mortality rate in upper caste Hindus and Muslims was more than double the rate of Europeans in Bombay. Even more shocking was that lower caste Hindus had over seven times higher mortality rates compared to Europeans. These social differences can be explained in how access to food was determined by caste and class. The, the narrative from colonial administrators is that a drought induced famine caused food insecurity, weakened immunity, and thus explaining higher cases of influenza flu in India. But what made lower classes and castes more vulnerable? Why were some of the population more affected by a famine compared to others? And was a famine an inevitable outcome of a drought? I mean, this is where I'll shift to an anti-colonial reading of pandemics in order to unpack more at what was at play during the 1918 pandemic. So uh, in a house, so I'm gonna go back to North America, in a house in, in 436 Hill Street, San Francisco, Punjabi labor and Bengali students operated in what was known as the Yuganta Ashram from 1913 to 1917. Here they plotted a revolution in India to overthrow the British Empire. Migration among Punjabi peasants across the Pacific Ocean to the west coast of North America was common at the turn of the century. Those in central Punjab had experienced growing prosperity during the late 19th century, but the combined effect of international agricultural price fluctuations, arable land scarcity, intermittent famines, and pandemics like malaria, cholera, plague, led some to migrate. Punjabi peasants arrived in San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Victoria, Vancouver, in the hope of a finding a better life. Instead, what they witnessed was racism and experienced exploitative working conditions. A group of these Punjabi laborers and also Bengali students started seeing their sense of dignity would be impossible to reclaim without ending British rule in India. So they officially formed the Gadar Party in the summer of 1913 in Oregon, and the headquarters was based in San Francisco, where they published a newspaper named the Hindustan Gadar. In Urdu, Gadar means mutiny and rebellion, and it's also an evocation of the 1857 uh, mutiny or uh, the first war of independence. So their publications provided an alternative interpretation of the experience of poverty, famine, and disease in India. I mean, for example, there's one booklet from 1916, Desh Bhagati Kid Geet, Patriotic Songs, written by Ram Chandra. And in his introduction, I'm gonna quote here, he makes this connection between colonialism, famine, and pandemics. 300 million of Hindustanis are slaves to 2 million English. The English, by extorting from India its wealth and grain, make the country so impoverished that the average income of each Hindustani is 37 rupees. The English export the whole of the wealth and grain of India to Europe so that in India, day by day, dearth, famine, and disease increase. In the last 20 years, 19 million natives of India have died of want and famine. In the last 50 years, 150 million of Hindus have fallen victims to plague, malaria, and other diseases. 90 million Hindustanis are now living on the barest means of subsistence." End quote. Uh, so this accounting by famine and disease was a frequent feature in Gadir, Gadir Party publications. While high mortality rates due to pandemics are also listed in colonial government documents, the Gadir Party did not see behind those numbers, the inevitable outcome of the cultural difference, cultural difference of the colonized or widespread individual negligence in the face of a micro, microbiological threat. Rather, for Chandra, you know, he was making a historicist argument. Those statistics were indicative of the violence of British colonialism. More specifically, these Punjabi revolutionaries attributed famines and pandemics in India as a consequence of the wealth that was being drained by the British. Chandra connected Indian outmigration to famine and disease that was generated from colonialism. So this line of argument about the drain of wealth from India to England 
was first expressed by Dadabai Naroji as early as the 1870s in a presentation given to the Bombay branch of East India Association of London in 1876, Naroji argued Indian poverty and famines are the outcome of the British appropriation, appropriating tax revenue that is not significantly reinvested into proje public projects in India, but principally went to England. So that lecture was given a few years after the Bihar famine of 1873, 1874, and Mike Davis also explains this, that how Naroji presented in Bombay just before the arrival of a devastating famine. So in a letter dated in 1897, Naroji would then begin making reference not only to famines, but also to the plague as a symptom of the colonial drain of wealth. After all, the Indian subcontinent witnessed a new round of a plague epidemic that began the year before and will continue for about three decades. A few years later, he would write an introduction for his book, Poverty and Un-British Rule in India. What then must be or can be the effect of the unceasing drain, which has now grown to the enormous amount of some 30 million pounds a year, if not famines and plagues, destruction and impoverishment. So now, Naroji and the Gadda Party didn't develop any further this connection between the drain of wealth due to colonialism and the prevalence of the plague. Yet Naroji did provide an outline for a framework for understanding how imperialist appropriation of wealth was based on historical, social, and political processes, such as the imposition of land revenue and the construction of the railway. However, similarly, historicization of pandemics does open up an anti-colonial rereading of these events. So more recently, you know, historian Mike Davis has similarly argued that droughts in India didn't inevitably lead to famines, nor did the influenza flu inevitably lead to a pandemic. There were social and historical processes that facilitated those jumps. So this warrants revisiting the historical conditions of the plague for better understanding Naroji and the Gadda Party's point. Uh, so in both of these didn't in reference the 1918 influenza flu. Uh, I mean, Naroji himself would pass away in 1917. But you know, if we they talked about the plague and the connections to colonialism. So the bubonic plague, I mean, if we go back into that history, the bubonic plague pandemic in the Indian subcontinent began in 1896 when it arrived via ship from Hong Kong to Bombay. This was more generally called the third plague pandemic in the world. It began in China with the first possible outbreak in 1792 in Yunnan province and resurging in the second half of the 19th century. Yersinia pestis, the bacteria associated with the plague, is transmitted among rats by way of rat fleas that can lead to a, a rat episodic. In the wake of a rat episodic, rat fleas leave the bodies of their dead hosts and seek a new species like humans for their home. A number of factors combine to create opportunities for plague outbreaks, including increased population densities, lack of adequate sanitary facilities, and malnutrition. Those with malnutrition face decreased immunity and experience higher levels of mortality. Grain storage sites and the grain trade were important transmission sites for the disease as they were preferred breeding grounds for rats. The combination of famines and the grain trade provided a deadly combination for the proliferation of the bubonic plague in Punjab. Yet these were not arbitrary or inevitable arrangements. Naroji and the Gadda Party did not go into the political ecology of the bubonic plague, but their fleeting statements argued that colonization brought new social and ecological relations that provided the conditions for famines and pandemics. Namely, the sanitary commissioner, other British administrators, wheat merchants, landlords, English capital were not just bit characters in these tragedies. So to understand how the introduction of a new variant of the H1N1 influenza virus or the Yersinia pestis bacteria became pandemics and how they disproportionately affected India and especially its peasants and workers, we need to examine the colonial transformation of the region's agrarian system. So I'll return to Punjab in order to tell the story. <laughs> 
So parts of Eastern Punjab, such as Gurgaon, Karnal, Rotek, Hisar, and Delhi were forcibly occupied by the British in 1803. This was followed by the annexation of Jalandhar in 1846, and the rest of Punjab was violently acquired in 1849. Till the mid 19th century, Eastern Punjab in contemporary India relied primarily on rain-fed agriculture, whereas Western and Central Punjab shared between Punjab and uh, between Pakistan and India today consisted of nomadic pastoralism and some agriculture near rivers inland using wells. So agriculture production required in-kind land rent payments to the central government as a portion of the harvest. So British rule underwent several changes to the pre-existing agrarian political economy. It made land as a private property, it formalized land tenure, such that it assigns selective castes and kin groups with land, and particularly those you know, that showed loyalty while conquering Punjab and putting down the 1857 mutiny. This effectively made whole sections of population sharecropper tenants, thus effectively landless. Fixed cash payments instead of in-kind payments to the government was another change. The later had the advantage of being variable with the climate. So if you had in-kind payments, you would, when after the harvest, you would give a portion of your, har your, of your harvest. But now with fixed cash payments uh, not connected to the harvest, then you know, the, the, the consequence was uh, land revenue payments, despite fluctuations in weather and prices, they took on debts to pay these, whatever payments that they were required. So Western and central parts of Punjab that were previously dominated by pastoralists were slowly made into agricultural fields, though large scale canal irrigation projects. So the British distributed land that was, you know, that was become, which was becoming agriculture through uh, a system of ownership where there was a few who had large land holdings while those uh, worked by, while they were worked by large sharecropper populations. So while the British Raj accumulated greater wealth through land revenue payments, these developments came together with the integration of Punjab in an international food market. Roads, railways, market towns, the port of Karachi, shipping lanes, the Suez Canal, uh, also development occurred simultaneously while making Punjab a cog in the international grain market. Where food was previously produced for feeding those in a hamlet, fields were quickly transformed to produce cash crops like wheat and cotton for the export market. Indeed, those assigned with large land holdings benefited from this new order. Yet the majority of small-scale sharecroppers uh, or small-scale peasants, sharecroppers, and other landless peoples were crushed under debt, disease, and famine. Droughts increasingly turned into famines during the British Raj rule because pre-colonial famine relief systems were dismantled. The British Raj made limited interventions during moments of grain scarcity, the famine of 1878 to 1879 killed about 1.2 million in Punjab, yet export trade continued with business as usual. Agricultural product producers in India did not choose per se to produce cash crops for the international market. However, a certain degree of coercion was involved. British imposed fiscal policies and the requirement to pay land revenue and money that made cash crops for exports the only viable option in this new political economy. Indian peasants were essentially subsidizing British industrialization. While peasants of Punjab were going hungry, British capital and workers benefited. Uh, British capital and workers benefited from the availability of cheap food produced there. British saw a drop in food prices during the Great Depression of 1873 to 1896. In consequence, real wages rose significantly where while there was a reduction in employment, this was not a sufficient effect on the overall gains made by British workers as a class. However, rising food prices in India were not matched by rising wages and the standard of living dropped. So the plague killed 2.64 million in Punjab from 1896 to 1920. In the process of the region's integration with an international grain market, the colonial transformation of the Punjabi landscape provided the conditions for the proliferation of the plague. Increased wheat production, the development of warehouses, 
construction of market towns and the installation of railway lines that connected these points provided both the sites for the proliferation of rodent populations and increased velocity of the transmission of the plague. I mean, during the summer months, Punjab and other parts of India usually experienced heavy monsoon rains. The agricultural system in the region was dependent on these rains for agricultural production, especially in the southeastern region of the province that exclusively relies on rainwater. When in the summer of 1918, the monsoon rains were much milder than usual, the regions faced severe crop failures. Since peasants were more integrated with an international market economy, the experience, the experience of a drought was that more intense. Peasants were increasingly engaged in producing agricultural commodities, that is to say, not food for local consumption, but cash crops for sale in order to get money to subsist. So by August of 1918, native newspapers based in the province cited the rising food prices as a combined result of the drought and export-oriented agriculture. While some called for the fixing of prices of essential goods, others asked for limiting food exports. When food prices were on the rise, this made it extremely difficult for those with small plots of land and those with, who were agricultural labor to pay for their subsistence and immunity needs. The combined effect of the arrival of the influenza flu in 1918 during a colonization-induced famine, not a drought-induced famine, meant that small-scale peasants and agricultural labor would be most impacted. So I'll just uh, wrap up here with uh, just some concluding comments. So I, I wrote this article as a means to better understand the present moment of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, through the experiences of you know, my great-grandparents' generation. Thinking with them, I understand the pandemic through its Greek etymology, pandemos. So combining the tension between pan, all, and demos, people, for me, this doesn't just mean that a disease that is widespread over a geography and society in a more expansive, you know, or maybe critical sense of pan, it describes the multiple ecological, social, and political, economic, and global relations through which the coronavirus interacts. That is to say, microbiological, agrarian, colonial, capitalist relations are part and parcel of the pandemic and not separate entity upon which the coronavirus acts upon. Yet we are all, you know, not all in the same boat as it were, as we weather the storm. Uh, you know, I'm thinking through Boy Dominguez's uh, his painting here. Uh, demos should indicate how the historical and geographical ways in which populations are differentiated and uneven. And remembering the political ways in which Pan has prefixed multiple anti-colonial politics, the history of the Gadda Party and the Friends of Freedom for India points to how an adequate response to the pandemic for liberation and care needs to be internationalist and anti-imperialist. Uh, so I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was, that was very interesting. Um, so if anybody has any um, questions, you can post them in the chat now and I'll read them out um, for Gazim to go over. Um, while we wait for that, I guess I kind of had a, just a general question um, that we can get started with. Um, I, I guess I just noticed a lot of similarities between the kind of the pressures that you were talking about in the, in the 1918 influence outbreak um, uh, put on kind of local farmers and this, this, the, the disruption that was being um, introduced um, by, by forcing them to sell to the, the international market and really disrupting that, um, those systems. Uh, very similar to the situation that's happening right now with the, the introduction of the farmer's law that, that is being heavily protested against. So I felt like there's a lot of similarities in, in the situation that's kind of happening now with um, that pressure of the international community kind of um, forcing in a law that's going to make farmers lose maybe some of the rights to their crops and force them to GMO um, types of systems. Um, I, I feel like there are a lot of similarities there, but there are also probably some interesting differences. Um, so if you could just kind of maybe talk to, to all of that, I'd be, I'd be interested in that. Yeah, I mean, so the, the laws which are uh, happening in, in India about, uh, which are, I guess, uh, I guess there are laws which are the increasing liberalization of agriculture. Uh, 
which is something uh, which has also like a, I guess a longer history, you know, going back from 1990, mm -hmm. where the, and I guess even if we go back, uh, it, the period that they're calling for is going back to the colonial period, essentially, uh, where, you know, through the process of decolonization, you know, through the process of, you know, these political demands made by, you know, peasants and, uh, and others uh, during the colonial period and, you know, in the anti-colonial movement, was to have uh, greater protections of agriculture. And, you know, you see some of those changes and institutions have happened, you know, in, uh, in the post-colonial period. Uh, and some of those are, let's say, the, the price protection the support that came in and was instituted in, uh, in India. And what these farmers are calling is, they're saying that, you know, these new laws are going to recede those and make those, those are changes effectively going back, you know, to the, to the colonial period. And, uh, and so, you know, so this is something the government, you know, not just related to the BJP, but, you know, from 1990 that they're trying to push. And I guess uh, if we, I mean, one is, I guess, maybe seeing this in the longer historical context, but uh, also seeing how, if we see the pandemic as not some uh, uh, external, element to capitalism or to imperialism, but something which is internal to it, you know, we can see how this, why is this the moment where these laws are being introduced, where mm -hmm. there was the anticipation, uh, maybe wrongly anticipated, that uh, if we, this is a moment where, you know, this is something which will be resisted by people. So if we push this during the pandemic, there won't be too much resistance because there's already uh, a militarized lockdown uh, because dissent is difficult, the, the question of gatherings are difficult. And at the same time, we're connected to that is like how a subsistence crisis is being produced through the pandemic. I mean, not produced because of the pandemic, but through that. I mean, so the how, you know, in the beginning of the lockdown, there was that moment where uh, the BJP government said that we're going to have uh, the stopping of interregional travels and you know effectively uh, and you know many people in India because of you know the, as a consequence of the liberalization of the economy are engaged in migrant labor and so you have millions of people who were uh, you know disconnected from their homes and if they have difficulty getting uh, survival issues or questions of subsistence they decided to go back to their villages and uh, this effectively, uh, people, you know, buses weren't running, so they started walking back home. Uh, and so I guess you can sort of see that how this is broadly creating a subsistence crisis. I didn't, and it didn't have to be this way. I mean, you, I think there are places where, you know, for example, in China, where they're, they took certain measures for considering the question about food security, uh, which is, I guess, something historically they've been considering questions of food security. Uh, you know, since the after the 1950s. Uh, so it, you know, it's not, these are just natural occurrences that it's Corona, which is causing subsistence crisis, but it's uh, the social context of that, uh, in which through this virus is acting. Uh, so I guess, uh, obviously there, you know, this virus is different, but I think we can, as let's say, maybe as a theoretical framework, we can see, I think it's helpful to think about coronavirus or any microbiological uh, element as internal to these systems. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I guess another question then. Um, so I guess right now, I, I sort of the, going back to the beginning of your talk when you were talking about the, the, this, like the 1918 flu, um, the, 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 the disproportionate impact throughout the entire um, pandemic on people in the global south and on marginalized and poor communities um, over the past year, most of the focus um, has been on the global north and the impact that the coronavirus is having on, I would argue, wealthier nations and wealthier portions of people. Um, I guess just going forward, if you wanted to talk kind of generally about how you think that that may switch as um, vaccines maybe become more prevalent in the north versus the global south or, or any type of um, kind of uh, factors or um, um, things that are going to be at play. That'll, that'll maybe shift that narrative so that we're going to start to see the, the impacts of it really being felt, um, not so much in the global north, but in the, the global south. Yeah, I mean, I, I, 
I mean, there's one thing I don't have a crystal ball, and I, I can't uh, make too much. Uh, for sure. Perspective. And I think uh, at least theory for me is not something uh, for predicting, but maybe more in terms of understanding the past. But I mean, that that said, I mean, why do we have? Uh, I mean, I can't give an explanation of why there are higher cases in places like United States versus, let's say, like in Pakistan. So I mean, like in Pakistan today, there aren't high number of cases, and so. Uh, which could be, I mean, each virus is unique in itself and the, the social and its interaction with, I mean, various factors can be at play. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, I think we can still think about how the terrain through which the, the virus is operating is one which is globally uneven. And I think we're starting to see something like uh, global uh, vaccine nationalism, where, you know, countries are hoarding up uh, vaccines so they have this knowledge, which countries have the capacity for the scientific production of vaccines uh, and how is that being controlled by certain nations? You know, there's already questions about the European Union trying to prevent the export of certain vaccines. Uh, you know, United States having a first United States kind of position, uh, a place like Canada is also, you know, trying to strategically trying to get a number of vaccines and, you know, countries like uh, Pakistan or, you know, places in Africa or Latin America are, you know, having, uh, not having you know, much access to these vaccines. And so that's, I mean, I guess that's why I guess the, the question of uh, understanding this globally is really important. Uh, seeing how, you know, things unevenly, how they're operating uh, is really important. And I think it's also really important to the reasons why we need to have an internationalist perspective on this, like to have internationalist mm -hmm. politics, which is thinking beyond, uh, in, you know, within the nationalist kind of, okay, our us first kind of uh, mentality. Be, I mean, there could be possibilities on what those possibilities are. I mean, who knows if, as you're saying, that the, uh, what narratives might come out into play. But I guess uh, in any cases, what preventative measures can we take uh, in these contexts? Mm -hmm. Okay. so. There's uh, no questions coming in in the chat, but I, I, we just have one, I guess I have one more um, for you, just generally speaking. I know you talked, I asked you about specifically the contemporary situation with farmers um, and that protest, but it just generally um, the kind of contemporary implications of um, studying this, this 1918 influenza outbreak um, and how, that, how, that, how that's important for today. Uh, I mean, what, so yeah, coming back to, I mean, just really important to try to see how, uh, like how microbiological, agrarian, you know, uh, these all are internal to a colonial capitalist set of relations. I mean, one thinking about the origins of the coronavirus, uh, how this, I mean, I think people were earlier saying that this was uh, something which emerging from wet markets in China. But I think new research coming uh, from the U.S. and the United from and from China, saying that you know what's really at play isn't wasn't uh, wet markets that wasn't where the first cases were, but th there's significant indications that this is probably from uh, you know agricultural areas where you have you know industrialized livestock. I mean, you've got populations of livestock in some provinces in China, of, you know, at, uh, in the hundreds of millions. Uh, and so this kind of the, the this kind of way of organizing agriculture in you know in tight spaces increases the possibilities of uh, mutations and for viruses. We often hear about avian flus coming, and uh, there's always the possibility. You know, I think uh, this. We, I think many people have been saying that you know we can we should realize that this is not the the end of pandemics, that we might see other pandemics in our in our life. And I think it's, you know, Rob Wallace has also been uh, kind of, uh, I mean, he's been influential in how I've been thinking about this, but, you know, he's uh, been saying, uh, making that kind of argument, I think also kind of trying to show how, you know, we can't think about uh, colonialism, capitalism, something, or how the pandemic is something external to these things. And so I think that's like something which is really important to kind of consider. Uh, I mean, obviously every virus is different the scenario is different. Uh, I, mean, I haven't studied enough about uh, COVID-19 and how it's affecting agrarian communities, but I think it's really important, uh, I mean, trying to think about these, and, and let's say the Canadian government often isn't thinking through things in this way. I mean, when we think about uh, migrant labor, uh, 
uh, in, in our agricultural systems and how things, or in, uh, in livestock factories where you have these meat processing plants, which are really important places, which had been, you know, really important places for the, the proliferation of this disease. We often think about, you know, senior homes as these key sites, but really what's being ignored is like how space is uneven, how, uh, you know, racialized communities, let's say in North America are all uh, very much, you know, affected by this. And this has to do with not things happening today, but historical reasons and the historical construction mm -hmm. of political economies. Yeah. A uh, question from Samia Khan. Uh, how critical is the urban geography, according to you, in the context of a pandemic? Um, so especially uh, the vertical housing and slums that we find in the global south. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know enough about uh, urban issues. I mean, my own uh, research is more in, in agrarian, but uh, and so I haven't uh, followed it enough. I know there were arguments, I mean, people were having concern about how in places like South Asia that slums will be key sites for the, the propagation of the disease. And so I don't know uh, how that's being played out. Uh, and so I can't uh, comment too much. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, I guess in theory, it makes sense that, you know, tight spaces would have and, you know, poor areas would be more impacted by the disease. But there could be other, you know, factors at play here as well. So I, mean, I, I would hesitate to give too much of a response. All right. Well, there are no other questions. Um, Samia says, thank you for answering it. Um, so... I guess that's probably a good place to end. Um, thank you everybody for coming. The next talk is on the 16th of March. And thank you so much, um, Tazim, for your speech. That was um, incredibly informative, um, giving, me, giving us all, I think, a lot to, to think about. Thank you very much.